So this is kind of how this all started. I taught at a pottery studio in Cincinnati called Funky Fired Arts. Um, I was teaching at high school at a time and working there and working at two restaurants. Just kind of, I was younger, just never slept. Um, and randomly, the guy who runs the place, named Ben Clark, came up and said, hey, a student wants to know how to do an alcohol reduction raku. Um, learn it and teach it this weekend. It's like, sure, okay. No one had ever seen it. Um, still to this day, it's a popular thing, but it just doesn't make its way around a lot for some reason. Uh, full disclaimer, I'm not a huge raku person in general. I like the kiln, kind of as a tool for a quick heat up. I like ferrochloride and a bunch of other things. Just your normal kind of raku glazes and things. I'm just not like a diehard fan. Um, but he said, yeah, learn how to do it and teach a workshop. So I did a trial run the next day. I went out and bought all the stuff I would need. And there was four or five of us that, you know, combined had quite a few years of clay experience. And we were out there and just kind of trial run. And you'll see it when it happens. It's just a weird, cool experience. You're spraying the alcohol on and these colors are just kind of moving and wrapping around the piece like these little halos. You breathe a little air into it and like, these colors just show up out of nowhere. And we were all out there literally just like, <laughs> what is going on here? So, uh... We got super excited about the whole process, so we started doing it. We called them Rakuten Annies. It was Kentucky, um, <laughs> technically Ohio, but close enough. So I used to teach um, alternate firing workshops. It'd be a full day workshop, and what we do is we would load a barrel for a barrel firing, put it, all the pieces in, get that going, and then as that was firing, we'd go over and do some Raku stuff, and then the next day unload the barrel. Um, but this is the book. If anyone's curious, it is a really, really good book. It's called Alternate Kilns and Firing Techniques. It's got everything you can imagine in here when it comes to pit fire, barrel fire, saggers, raccoons, ferrochloride fuming, still things I've never heard of, iridescent luster fuming, how to build your own downdraft kiln with a stove pipe and a barrel. Um, but the main one here, and this is what I just copied your little pages from, is the alcohol reduction raccoon. Uh, in there on your first or second page it is going to have the recipe for the copper wash. Uh, I've seen a couple different recipes out there. This is the one I standardly use just because these guys kind of perfected the method. There are plenty of ones out there. It is literally just four colorants and a frit just to kind of help it stick, help it flux a little bit. So this recipe calls for red iron oxide, copper carbonate, cobalt, and black copper oxide. So all four just heavy colorants that go into basically glaze chemistry to make colors pop. Um, and that's it, a little frit, something called frit 3110 that just kind of helps everything stick and helps everything flex a little bit. The recipe is there. Uh, Matt was telling me he's had pretty good results just using nothing but black copper oxide, like 90% of that in a little frit. So basically the idea is you have a colorant of some kind and a little frit to help it all stick and help it flux. That's kind of the basis of it. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and start the raku kiln just so it's heating up as I'm talking to you. Um, you're welcome to come forward and take a peek. I mean, this is a pretty standard, I'm just gonna light it. Um, but everything has its do's and don'ts and good ways to do it and bad ways to do it. This little burner setup I have, I could fill a raccoon kiln 10 times the size. I turn this thing like 1 50th of the way the nozzle goes and it roars. So uh, I'm gonna start this guy real quick. I have my piece already inside of here and I'll talk about the whole process. The few of you that got here towards the end there, the one thing you missed is, uh, I do work here, by the way. My name is Sean, if you guys don't know me. Um, I got here a couple hours early from work yesterday and did a trial run. That's attempt number one. Matte black, believe it or not, it was beautiful. When I did that little blow into the chamber, it went purple, blue. It was one of the better ones just off the bat. And I was a little anxious, just like, oh, I'm gonna set that color. And I took it out and on the way to the banding wheel, it went black. And I said, no. Oh. Round two. Um, so there's a lot of trial and error involved. Color-wise, I kind of like it. It's a little scaly because I think I went a little heavy on the actual glaze. I sprayed it on, but I really wanted to make sure I got enough on there and I think I went one or two coats too heavy. Um, and then it went a little orange. It had some really nice bright blues and purples on there also. This whole thing is just a crapshoot of timing. I mean, there's a lot going on. Uh, it's not a lot. You need multiple people. It's nice to have somebody kind of help out, lift up the chamber and spray the gas, but you got to get the glaze just right. You got to heat it up just right. You have to put the right amount of alcohol, kind of burp the air and do it all really quickly, keep it hot enough. Um, so this one, 
went a little bit more orangey yellow. The color was nice. I sprayed a sealant on it, I think, a little bit too soon. It was still a little damp. So when you get it wet, the whole thing darkens because water absorbs in, because this is low fire. Um, so when I sprayed the sealant on, the whole thing kind of stayed darker. So this one actually was a little brighter and better the first time around. And then this is really more of actually what I'm looking for. I wouldn't mind a little bit more orange in there, kind of a variation from orange to blue to coppery to green. Um, but that's kind of the best of the three, which makes sense. Trial one, trial two, trial three. You guys are here for number four. So let's just hope if it's anywhere in this range, nice. If it's this, I'll just pretend that's what I was going for all along. So I'm gonna start this kiln real quick. I glazed them yesterday, so it should be all right. I could probably blast it up fairly quickly. Um, that thing's a monster. Though. Like I said, I've got that thing barely on. If I turn that full, I'd probably blow up the planet. Um, what's that? Oh, so we're gonna hit 1750 is the max temperature we're going for, which is pretty darn low fire. Um, the glaze doesn't really have a silica or anything else in it, so this thing is gonna still absorb water and it is not functional. I will not go fill this with coffee and drink out of it. It's strictly decorative. Something to throw your keys in, something to make a plaque. Planters are fairly nice with it if you don't mind your plant being filled with copper carb and whatever else is in there. Um, so another thing that's kind of necessary is you do need a pyrometer of some kind to tell the temperature. Most of us that do Raku are used to just that red orange glow, you know you've got to about the right temperature. Um, these don't really glow. The copper wash and the black copper oxide make the whole thing like a black matte. So it'll flux a little and you can kind of see it, but it's really hard to figure out what temperature it is inside of the kiln without it. So on the right side there, my very fancy trash can with a pyrometer on top set up. It's really the only way to go. I just got a little digital pyrometer. So I'll just occasionally check that. What I'm trying to get to is 1750 and then I'll pop open that clamshell, grab it out, and I'm going to put it on this little banding wheel. Um, I've got a little piece of kiln brick on there just to help kind of prevent the banding wheel from getting coated in God knows what, rubbing alcohol and glaze. And I'll spin it and I'm just going to do multiple layers of rubbing alcohol basically on the actual outside of the piece. And it's a pyrotechnic show. I mean flames will shoot off. I kind of was trying to decide if I should wrap my face in a wet rag or something, but um, flames will shoot off three, four, five feet in the air the whole time you're spraying. I mean it's 1750 degree piece you're basting in alcohol basically. Uh, it's another one of those things, I have no idea who decided this is something you could do. Like just the weirdest, clay people are so weird. Like ferrochloride, it's used for like etching into metal and cleaning motherboards. Like Raku people decided to put that on their piece. So there's a lot of real interesting things going on. Like I said, in this book there's all sorts of fun ones, but I'm going to spray six to nine layers and that's kind of I think the most delicate part is you want to get enough of the alcohol on, most of it's burning away as it's trying to hit the piece but you want to go quick enough to where it's still hot when I go to put it in our little homemade reduction chamber. So what I've got is basically a wash tub. Anything will work. Technically, it doesn't even need to be something that's super heat treated because it's filled with sand. And I've got a metal bowl down in the bottom. Steel works nice, but once again, I'm going to put some sand in that. It's not going to get crazy, crazy hot, but you do want something that can handle some temperature. In that, I'm going to put a little bit of sand as well just to help resist that kind of thermal shock and some I usually just use pine needles just because they're around. So when I set the piece on it, it needs to be hot enough for those pine needles to ignite and for a flame to happen. Without flame, you're never going to get that reduction of, of oxygen. You're never going to get the colors to start to happen. So I'll throw a couple more pine needles on top so the whole thing flames up. And then I'll immediately cap the whole thing in a Pyrex bowl. Um, it's got to be, this is the one that needs to be Pyrex heat treated tempered glass if at all possible. Um, and that's the coolest part about the whole thing is, like I said a couple people earlier, 
When we fire to cone 10, we fire high temperature gas, there's a chemical change going on inside of the kiln. It's actually a reduction of oxygen. So the flame has to find oxygen anywhere it can, so it penetrates into the clay and into the glaze to steal oxygen. That's why you cannot get copper carbonate bright red glazes in an electric kiln at cone 10 unless they're pigment based. Yes, sir? There is a little, so in general, if I put it in there, it was a little cool and it didn't ignite it, I'd still get a little bit of this to happen, but you really want that big open flame. And then when you cover it, it's trying to find that flame anywhere it can. So it's kind of penetrating into the pot. Um, so yeah, I mean, at cone 10, it's obviously this is much lower temperature, totally different process, but there needs to be some chemistry happening for this to do what it's doing. I mean, obviously when I took the piece out, it was black. Don't mind that. Um, then it went to copper. The whole thing was as shiny as a penny. And then over time, it's where the reds and the blues and the purples kind of all started to show up. So whoever came up with this ingenious idea of, hey, I'll put a glass bowl on top so I actually witness what's happening inside of there. Another kind of stroke of genius. So the one issue I'm having, it's going to be a little bit of a teeter-totter is you really want your bowls to be slightly different size. Mine are identical. So when I set the glass bowl on top of the metal bowl, I got it really covered in sand and it's fairly fine. You need to get a really tight seal. So Andrew already helped out and said you spray the sand with a little bit of water right around the edge and it'll kind of pack tighter. So when you want it airtight, you want it airtight. And then when you want air to get in, you want air to get in. So there are steps to do it. So you don't want it constantly leaking air the whole time. So I'm gonna peek at some temperature here. I'm gonna be kind of going back and forth and back and forth. So I started that like Five minutes ago, it's 1400 degrees already. So I've got that thing, you know, on 1%. So because I glazed them yesterday and it's a fairly strong clay with some grog, I think it should be able to handle me blasting it a little bit. Yeah. It does. Yep. You do need 91% isopropyl alcohol. And that is also in the little handout there. Um, I have tried it. I, the first time I did this, they must have thought I was a meth dealer or something because I bought out like three stores of their rubbing alcohol. I'm sure they thought I was like making up some drugs in my basement with this or something. Like, who needs this much rubbing alcohol? So yeah, I found uh, pretty decent sized jugs this time around. They're like 250, they're cheap, but you do need 91%. Uh, the first time I bought out two stores and I didn't have any more, so I had to do the 71%. I had a it's like a 50-50 mix and it kind of worked, but for whatever reason, you really want that 91% isopropyl alcohol. Do you recommend a full I do. Uh, you're gonna actually see me wearing this mask. It's not necessarily for fumes, it's more just to keep the beard packed in. Um, I burned off some eyebrows and things. I've never had the beard quite this large during uh, flame shooting out six feet. I probably should be smart and have a bucket of water somewhere around here so I can just douse my face. Um, I'm pretty safe when it comes to fire. I hate to say flame proof because that's just bad news for what we're about to do. Um, a lot of years working in restaurants and working in the ceramic industry, you tend to just, fire doesn't hurt as much anymore. <laughs> and then my other question is, how permanent is your finished piece? So, there are, so it's a Raku. Um, over time, no matter what you do, this will start to get dull, it will oxidize, and in the long term, get somewhere like this. Um, I do recommend spraying a sealant on it. Uh, in your little handout there, the guy recommends something called JASCO, J-A-S-C-O. He says there is only one brand that will do it, and it's JASCO brand tile sealant. Uh, I've never even heard of it. They probably have it, I probably could have gone to Home Depot. He said there's benefits of working here at Clay Planet, we stock tile sealant. So this is made by a company called Duncan. I hate to say it's, it is a tile sealant. What I sell it for is usually teachers who are painting pieces instead of glazing them and they want to seal it and make it look like it's got a glossy appearance. Uh, I also use this on um, barrel fired and pit fired pieces. No matter how much burnishing and terra sigillata and preparation I do, when it's wet it looks the best, always, no matter what. So the idea is to give it a somewhat wet looking finish or turn it into a fountain so it's constantly wet. So um, it's a nice product. It seals it, gives it a little bit of a glossy look. This is the super, super gloss. 
Um, we stock a regular gloss and a matte and a super matte. I usually just go with a normal gloss. Um, but here a little bit later, this is fairly cool now. I could probably spray this one also. When you're using this stuff, thin little coats. One nice thin coat from six, eight, ten inches away. And if you don't like it enough after a minute, another thin coat. If you do it too much too quickly, it gets syrupy. It looks like corn syrup running down your piece. You can actually see the drips and it seals like that. Um, it's literally just a spray can of clear is the best way to put it. So, Since we're at 15, almost a second ago, take a peek. So 1,690 degrees. So I'm looking for 1,750. Um, so once we hit 1,750, you're going to see me just a really terrible ballet of just running around and doing stuff out there. I welcome everyone to come as close as you're willing to. Really the only dangerous part is going to be when I'm actually applying the rubbing alcohol um, right here, just because flames are going to be going everywhere. Um, when I go and put it in the reduction chamber, I definitely recommend everyone trying to come around and take a peek. So when I take it out, it's going to be black. When I spray it with a uh, mixture of the 91% rubbing alcohol, it's going to do these halos of copper and blue and red as the fire starts or as the alcohol starts to soak in. When I put it in the reduction chamber, it'll still be kind of black, but as soon as I seal it, there's another step. You seal it, you have to pop open the edge and spray a little bit more rubbing alcohol in and then cover it. And as soon as I do that second spritz, the whole thing's gonna go copper like a penny. Should, the whole thing should go copper like a penny. Like I said, one, two, three. So uh, the more you do it, the better you get at it, but it's still, there's so much timing involved, so. It's been bisque fired, correct. So I bisque it, um, and this is not necessary, but it doesn't have to be anything too high. The higher you bisque it, the stronger it will be. So I do have no people who will bisque up to cone one, cone two, cone three, but then you don't get the absorbency when you spray the glaze in. So a normal cone 04 bisque is great. That's kind of your standard bisque for just about everything in my opinion. So let me take a peek. Seventeen eighty-five. So I prefer going a little bit too hot. I can always let it sit for a minute till it gets back down to seventeen fifty, um, and it's going to take me a minute to do it. So I know it says seventeen fifty, between seventeen fifty and eight hundred, just because I know the time it's going to take me to do everything. It's going to drop the temperature down some. So we're ready. We're going to do it. So anyone who would like to come forward and check it all out, just give me a little bit of space, kind of on this side for the time being. So that tiny little touch I did, dropped the whole thing back down to 1650. Blast it back up, I'm gonna open it up and we'll be good to go. You really barely need gloves for this because you're far enough away doing everything. I hate gloves, I can't feel anything, I can't do anything, but for taking it out, I'll grab it, use the gloves. And then for the hand that's gonna be turning the banding wheel when it's on fire, I'll use gloves. These have been through a couple of wood fires, so the tips of these fingers are pretty much gone, kind of hard to move. Seventeen hundred sixty-five degrees, so we should be good. Stop. Drop. It will be warm. So you see, it's got a bit of a sheen to it, but it's still pretty much just like a matte black. So flames, just everyone's aware. So I spray it on, I give it a second, let this kind of fire burn away, and then I'll spray it on again. Try not to burn the plastic tip. So everyone see the color floating around the outside of it. So as the alcohol is hitting it, the whole thing's just going copper. And as I stop, it's got this funky little halo as the alcohol is burning around the piece. So I'm gonna do, Two or three more coats, really try to get that alcohol on there. Try not to set the ground on fire again. It's probably good. Couple of pine needles down in the bottom of the bowl.
Couple pine needles on the top of the bowl. Once we've got flame, we will seal it and we'll look for little gaps. It's a great, where's Andrew? That's a great trick. Thank you, sir. So I give it 10, 15, 20 seconds, and then I'm, what I'm gonna do is lift up the side, I'm gonna do one more blast of rubbing alcohol, and you'll see the whole thing should go copper like a penny. This one I will need a little glove. A weird process. I'm telling you, like, who invented this? It comes from the raccoon nanny and a still. <laughs> All right. Uh, just size wise, so like the opening, if you can get it to where this glass bowl like sits in a little bit of the angle of the bowl or it's a little bit bigger. Um, what I like to do is I'll take the entire bottom bowl and I will wrap it in foil, multiple, multiple layers so I can build up like a little ledge so I can just smash that glass bowl kind of down on top of it. So you're gonna see the whole thing just copper penny and it's gonna kind of sit like this. And if I left it and did nothing else to it, It'll very slowly over the next 10, 15 minutes start to get a little bit of color. Um, but what I'll do is I'll kind of burp it, let a little bit of air get in. Um, what I actually like to do is after it cools down some, I'll slide over, just give it a little bit of an edge and I'll just kind of blow a little bit of air into it. In a perfect world, immediately on the opposite side where you blow the air in, it'll get a little blue, a little purple. Last time I had blue air and I covered it and about 30 seconds later, the color all started to show up. So, which is also fine. Doesn't quite have the oohs and ahs of Sean just breathes the blue onto the pot, but um, it's nice. So it's just going through a funky little reduction here. All the oxygen's just kind of getting eaten away. This is the uh, and we wait moment. How's everyone doing? <laughs> Yeah, you know, to be at work on Saturday is usually a bummer, but it's a good one when you're doing some sort of fire-related ceramics thing, so. I'm not really a, a morning kind of person. <laughs> I really have never been. So the idea of getting up and coming down here and doing this, like, yeah, but, but it'll be cool. <laughs> oh, boy, I'm so glad we did the Raku first. Well, here's the cool thing. People think, like, yeah, but when am I, how am I going to do this at home or this and that? It's like, I think this is one of the easier things you can, you know, you don't need. Even the raku kiln, this big old clamshell has been sitting under a tarp for years. We have a shopping cart in the back, I'm gonna like to show everyone, lined with insulating blanket that we use as a raku kiln. <laughs> raku kilns are very simple to build. You just need something to contain heat. Um, you get a little burner system, you get the, some sort of fiber blanket or brick and you can build your own. So any little chamber, I mean this thing's 10 times bigger than I need. I've got another raku kiln in the back that's 20 times bigger. I mean for one piece I need a little 12 by 12 by 12 inch box. Uh, that thing, also yeah, to get, to, the to get it to temperature um, over a long period of time, it'll eat away at the, you know, opening it up when it's that hot. Uh, it's not always great for the elements, but it's not going to like break them by any means. It'll just kind of shorten the life of them a little bit. Um, and it just takes a lot longer. Even if you do a 9999 ramp this kiln up as quick as possible. I mean, that might have, that was twice as fast as I thought it was going to be. I'm going to kind of just dig away the sand on one side and just push the bowl slightly and I'm just going to blow a tiny little bit of air in there just to kind of get the process going a little bit. And what you should see is on the opposite side where I blow the air in, whether it's immediately or whether it takes a while, and this is all just temperature based. Um, it should start to go a little bit of those purple and blue kind of halo on this side. So watch your kind of eyeballs around on the back side here. So everyone see the rim? Yeah. So where I blew in stayed a little bit more coppery and the rest of it around it starting to go a little bit more of those kind of purples and blues. 
and it's just going to keep changing like this. And this is kind of the cool part. Within reason, when it gets to the color I like, I'm going to take it out and spray water on it and kind of set that color. If I do it too quickly, it gets too much oxygen. Round one, I showed everyone. It was the most beautiful purpley blue. I was like, all right, that's the color I want. I hadn't done this in a couple years, and I was like, I'm going to set it. Just from the walk from here to there, it went black. I think eventually it would probably darken to where you would lose some of this. Um, I've never let that happen. I'm too giddy like a little kid. I want to get it out of there and do stuff to it, but. So blue, purple on the rim there, real coppery on this side. It's got a little kind of funky blue green over there. So you could just take the bowl off, spray it right there. You could, if you love it, you take the bowl off, you spray in water and that's it. Um, which is technically what I'm gonna do, but I might Give it another little breathe of air just kind of to see what happens. So I think I'm going to try to get the other side to kind of keep up a little bit. I like to have the transition, um, but I'm going to pop that rim a little bit and just give it another little breathe of air. So a little more purple showing up on the shoulder here. Still saying a little copper on this guy. Oh. So the first time I did this, I actually did it in this little trash can and it was perfect size. I didn't need a ton of sand, but I really could not get my, bare hands were great, but you can't quite grab this bowl barehanded. I mean, it's hot, but it's not like scald your face off hot. I mean, technically, I guess if I put my face on it, it might be scald my face off hot. Let's not try. It's a little more funky purple going on on this side. Still seeing a little coppery over here. Any suggestions, Master Potters? Depends on the shape of your vessel, too. You talk about why, why you don't take it out right now. It's still very hot with a lot of heat, and the hotter it is, the faster it reacts color to color. So you want it to get cool enough that it'll hold the color. When you take it out, it won't immediately go black. Right Which was step number one Sean forgot yesterday when I was remembering how to do all this was, perfect, that's the color I want. And I took it out too quick and it was still, I mean, it had only been in this whole chamber for maybe three minutes. Um, I was excited. I'm, I want to take it out now, I'm excited, so. <laughs> Well, you got to break a few, you got to waste a few, you know, it's like anything else. You got to trim through the bottoms of a hundred or so. Yeah. What clay do you recommend? So I, that's a great question. So because of the process, Raku in general, even though you're only going to low temperatures, it's kind of a harsh process. You're going from zero to 16, 17, 1800 degrees in 20 minutes. So I like clay that's got a little sand and even better, it's got grog in it. Grog is already fired clay that's been pulverized down. If you held them in your hands, it looks identical to sand, um, but it doesn't shrink because it's already been fired. So any clay with a good amount of grog will help prevent thermal shock, which is that real hot to cold. I mean, I could probably dip this thing in water and it wouldn't shatter on me. I'm not gonna try that just yet, but. Um, so the clay I'm using is our smooth sculpture clay, which already has some real fine sand and grog, but we just came up with a new one that has um, 35 mesh grog in it. Sculpture Raku, Orion Stout, Soul Date, any of these heavy grog clays. Just put it this way, porcelain would be my last choice, although I have seen people Raku porcelain. And then Grogzilla would probably be, you know, you couldn't break it if you tried, good luck. So anything kind of towards the white stoneware with grog side is what I prefer. So this piece is a little larger than the other ones I'm doing because that it holds on to a little bit more heat. So I treat it the, kind of the same as the smaller one, so it might be why it's color change wise, it's not quite as drastic of that, the last round there. So nice blue up on the rim there, got some spots of purple over here. Should probably see what's happening on this side. Mainly just kind of coppery.
FYI, when you do this, if you decide to do the little blow into it technique, don't breathe back in. It's hot. You can, I can taste it. Yesterday I was driving home from work, like, <laughs> it's like somebody gargling like warm rubbing alcohol. I like alcohol. I like it a lot. I don't like gargling warm rubbing alcohol. Yep. Yeah, if you get close, you can smell it. You can, I mean, I can taste it right now, so. Um, I consider myself an alcohol aficionado, actually, but this is not on the list. It's, uh, I'm more of a bourbon man than a rubbing alcohol man. You know what's funny? I actually was thinking about that for some reason on the drive over. I would consider testing it on some really terrible Heaven Hill five buck gallon of bourbon. Um, I'm just not sure really how that would all go down. It would probably be hilarious regardless. It just seems like a waste, even bad bourbon, just to pour it on something, so. Well, a 70% doesn't work too well. Yeah. Bourbon's yeah. Bourbon's there you go, exactly. Although I've got 140 proof Elijah Craig at my house that's, uh, you know, getting up there in alcohol content, so. So did everyone see the copper kind of starting to disappear now on this side? I consider saying, oh, what the hey, let's just take it out. Patience, I don't have it but it's good to have here. That's why you have the bourbon. That's, <laughs> yeah. It's so got a good time to just take a break. I'm gonna give it another 30 seconds a minute and see, I kinda like the color here. I think because it's bigger piece and it's warm, so this has already sat in there probably about as long as I usually go. Um, but the color's really nice now. So I like there's blue on this side, purple, and the rim is, when I glaze, I spray glaze, for some reason I always forget to really get the rim. So usually, which is kind of nice, you get a black rim. So wherever it's unglazed, basically. So I get a black rim and then these really bright, shiny kind of colors underneath. So I'm gonna pop this and I'm gonna spray it with water right there in the bowl just to kind of start to set it. And then I'll just pull it over here and do the same. I'm looking for my water bottles. <laughs> Smells good. <laughs> I can still smell it. So, kind of nice, bright, coppery colors underneath. You got copper on one side, purples. Nice little bit of blue here. There's something about spraying certain colors first. Has anyone heard of? You hit the certain colors, they're hotter. You spray them first. That was new to me, but somebody I saw it yesterday when I was just messing around online it was a different type of firing it was more of a copper fuming but the principle seemed like it would that's good i i think one two three four worse the next best the next best and this is probably uh you guys came at the right time i'm glad you didn't show up yesterday Cool. Nice little bit of a uh, kind of orange there on the bottom. I had a piece come out once. It was more like uh, I like to make functional looking pieces and do this process just to mess with people like a mug with a handle and you know you can't drink from it. <laughs> Bottles, things like that. But uh, I had a really nice little spouted piece that I tried this on once. And for whatever reason, probably just because thickness versus thinness, the little spout coming off was bright orange, yellow, red, and the whole body of the rest of it was like a purple blue. So what we would love in a perfect world, is everyone see how bright and vibrant this purple and this orange and all this is down here at the bottom? If you got the whole piece, so here at the top you've got it, and here at the bottom you've got this real nice color. If you get the whole piece of that, I mean, it's like neon. Um, so down here at the bottom, if I could get the entire piece to kind of follow that, that would be perfect. Cool, all right.